Um, all, all written by amateur astronomers. Very practical stories. And then we ran stories in Astronomy Magazine about how to build a Dobsonian telescope. We wrote the story, and then we had the accountants, the accounting staff, build the telescope. And we checked out whether we had made the article clear enough that they could figure it out. Um, for a while, Astromedia Corporation tried to sell telescopes. We tried to sell Astroscans. There's Bob Moss, that's the company president again posing with uh, an astroscan. We also published for several years uh, Odyssey magazine, a kids magazine. Here's in November 1991, fly, uh, Voyager, uh, I think Voyager 2 flying past Saturn. Um, I wrote a story for that issue. Here's Nancy Mack, the editor of, of uh, Odyssey. Um, the first, first woman in a higher level she could talk the rest of us guys into doing anything for her. Um, Greg Walt Sinotsky, uh, associate editor for Odyssey, uh, he wrote a lot of the stories and um, uh, he's a real fun guy to uh, deal with. This picture happens to have been taken um, when he, they somehow wangled enough money to send him down, down to JPL to cover one of the Voyager flybys. If you, like I said, Nancy could talk us into doing anything for her. The thoroughly magnificent Richard and Robert show was a monthly feature in Odyssey magazine. Um, there's Richard, there's Robert, um, there's, I don't know, old man something or other, and a bunch of kids. Um, it's really strange when you walk into a place where there are children and they go, you're Richard from the Richard Robert show. And you go, yes, it's me. Well, OK, how does the story happen? Um, in the later days, we ended up, um, we would write up a little write up for a major story. This is a house written story. Uh, I was going to write it. I was going to go to JPL, and I was going to cover the Neptune flyby. And it's, I mean, it's, in some respects, it's boilerplate. This feature, you know, this feature focuses on a really scientific results of the Neptune flyby. We had a problem. We went to press before the flyby was really over. So we really, really were, were uh, working by the, the skin of our teeth in terms of time. So there I am at JPL going ticka, 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 ticka on my little teeny weeny NEC 8201 computer with 32 kilobytes of memory. Um, and we used a um, 300 baud modem to send the text back to the office um, where it was set in type. Um, this is the actual page of me working through what the pictures show um, and which ones we're going to use and probably how we're going to use them. This is the, the thumbnail layout that I put together. And we would have faxed it into the office and said, okay, guys, this is what the layout's going to look like. <laughs> make, make a magazine out of it. Um, uh, usually, um, very often, I would do a, a marker layout for a story. This is a Jupiter flyby story. Uh, so you can see, well, you know, there's, there's Big Jupe, and then here's the opening spread, and then the text begins, and you've got a box with info and more more pictures and stuff like that. So you, you do this kind of thing to understand the flow of the story. Um, there's also technical details like that's a two-page spread, that's a two-page spread, that's two that's one page of color, but that's only black and white on that page. That's black and white, that's color, 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 black and white, black and white, black and white. The magazine has a pattern of black and white and color, and you're always building your layouts to go over these technical constraints. Um, this is a galley of type that's been faxed to me. I've marked it up with my changes for this Neptune story. And it gets and here's the contents page, Triumphant Neptune. And then here's the story based on those little thumbnail sketches. And 
brand new Celestron, you know, blah, blah, the advertising begins. I was the staff photographer also because nobody else knew how to run a camera, which is not strictly true, but I knew how to make prints in the dark room and nobody else could do that. Um, so a lot of funny stuff got, got done. Um, Diane was one of our secretaries at some point. I don't know when or why this picture was taken when they asked me to give this talk. I found this in the archive and I said, click, let's put it on, on a slide. Um, my managing editor, Nancy Mack, uh, Stephanie Keel, who was, hmm, I don't remember exactly what Stephanie did, but she was always fun to be around. <laughs> um, when I covered events for Telescope Making Magazine, um, there's the NEC 8201. I look much more relaxed than I did at JPL. Um, sitting on a tree having my wheat thins in Mountain Dew. Okay, that's, that's that for the talk. And I think we actually made it on, the, on time, right? Okay, got two minutes for questions. Yes? Uh, when were you appointed the editor? Um, I'd been working there about 16 months or something like that. I was hired as technical editor. Um, at some point, um, I said, you know, I'm calling the scientists. They're writing the stories that I, <laughs> that I propose that they write. They're, they're sending them in. I'm accepting and rejecting the manuscripts. And I'm telling the edit, other editorial staff what to do. And I'm assigning stuff. Um, Technically, some of those jobs should have been done by the managing editor. But after Steve died, she went into a sort of a purple funk. And so I started doing those things. Um, at some point, I said, you know, I'm doing the editor's job. It would be nice to be the editor, not the technical editor. And it would be nice to know that. Because when I hand my business card or when I call up the scientist and talk to him, I'd like him to understand who he's talking to. So you go into the publisher and you complain. <laughs> you say, hey, job description must equal what job is. Yeah. Um, basic problem whenever you're working for other people. More questions? Yes? Sorry I came in late, Richard. I, I just remember fondly being up at the, one of the Oregon Star Parties of the eight that I went to and attended over the years. And I was running this, the club's H Alpha Solar Scope and it had problems on this mead telescope that was loaned to me by Doug McCarty at Mount Community College, and I was struggling with trying to get this thing to track the sky, and this gentleman comes up, and he says, you have a problem with this telescope, you need to contact these people, and tell them about it. I said, well, I've been running it all across the country for 10,000 miles, I know what's, what's wrong with it, and I said, I think I know what's wrong with it, and he says, you don't realize who I am, I'm Richard Berry, he says, I didn't know who he was at the time. Of course, I said, I, I realized who Richard Berry was, I, I was just shocked that he was standing right next to me at the Oregon Star Party. That's when I first met Richard, and I realized he knew a lot more about telescopes than I did <laughs> as an observer just out running this solar scope. So it was great. When a scope is broken, you look at it and you say, it's a broken scope. I mean, you can tell. <laughs> you should be able to tell. Um, I struggled with it all across the country. And I, you yeah. were the first one to tell me that I need to do something, for the, telling the company about it. So I was so appreciative of what you told me. OK, that's probably our two minutes. Oh, if Jim doesn't hold me off, I'll answer your question. Yes. When did you leave the Sun magazine? Um, 1991, January or February, I can't remember which. There's a big pile of astronomy magazines in boxes out there. Take as many as you want. Yeah. Take as many as you can. I'm getting rid of them. Thanks, for sure. If you don't take it, they're going into the garbage on the way home. Oh, what a shame. Take as many as you want. They are pristine, clean, unused, unmarked, perfect copies. 